if you spell Pfizer backwards, it's Resfip, which translates in Hebrew to Reshef, which means the burner or the ravager. And it's an ancient West Semitic god of the plague and the underworld, the companion of Anath and the equivalent of the Babylonian god Nergal. Now, this may sound very far out to people, but um, there is this pattern of inversion with certain uh, occult groups, as you might describe them. And so, you know, what, what's, what is going on in this? Are there, are there occult groups that inhabit these power structures and are, I mean, I know we said earlier, like it's a meta fraud. It's not the traditional stereotypical fraud, but now I'm sort of questioning the opposite. Like, do you think there are these occult groups pushing certain agendas onto the world, let's say, and um, the argument by, you know, many people that have written in this area that they try to hide these things in plain sight, right? They all, all typically say what they're going to do. They're very blatantly open about it. Um, and now what's coming to mind, I don't know if you saw this going on on social media recently, but at the Grammys, they had that transgender performer doing a, a song called Unholy. Yeah. And yeah. it was just and a guy. About Pfizer. Yeah. Dressed up as Satan. All there. Everyone's dressed up as devils. They're all dancing around, flame shooting everywhere. It's all this trans, you know, performance. And then right at the end of the performance sponsored by Pfizer, like, I mean, it, it's almost like out of a movie. Uh, so I don't know. Like, what do you think about all this? Hey, everybody. Welcome to the What is Money show. I am thrilled to have you here joining me on my mission to help shine light on the corruption of money. Now, if this is your first time listening to the What Is Money show, I strongly recommend that you go back to episodes one through nine first, which lays a lot of the groundwork for many of the concepts that we explore on the show. These first nine episodes are my series with Michael Saylor, and thousands of people have told me that this is the best podcast series they've ever heard, hands down, and that it was instrumental to their understanding of money and Bitcoin. So if you're looking to start a deep dive into the nature of money, I don't think there's any place better that you can start other than episode one of this show. Now, a little bit about this show and how it makes money. The What Is Money show is 100% sponsor based. So all of our revenues are derived from direct sponsorships. And I strive to be very selective about the sponsors that I work with, specifically only using sponsors that I use personally, and also choosing sponsors that have values which are well aligned to the values expressed on this show, such as freedom, education, self-sovereignty, etc. So what I'm gonna do now is a few ad reads right at the top of the show, and then I'll do a few more ad reads in the middle. And I hope you'll take the time to listen to them, as again, these are hand-selected sponsors, and I think you'll like what they have to offer. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, iCoin Technology. iCoin has just released a sleek new hardware wallet. Looks like a mini iPhone, a little touch screen and camera on it. Uh, the device has no Wi-Fi, no cellular connection, no GPS, it's a strictly physically cold hardware wallet. Uh, like I said, it's got a high res three inch touch screen. It's got a camera for air gapping the wallet. Uh, it's got optional Bluetooth compatibility. And it's a really a, a brand new UI UX experience for a hardware wallet, making it very accessible, easy to use, not intimidating. And as we always talk about on this show, the only way you can truly own your Bitcoin is by having it in self-custody. So you need a device like iCoin Wallet to truly own your Bitcoin. Go to iCoinTechnology.com today and use promo code BITCOIN23 for 30% off of this new sleek hardware wallet. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Ledin. Ledin lets you do more with your digital assets. For instance, Ledin offers a B2X loan product that lets you leverage your existing Bitcoin to buy even more Bitcoin. Or you can also get traditional Bitcoin collateralized US dollar loans through Ledin as well. Ledin also offers both Bitcoin and USDC denominated savings accounts, letting you generate yield on your digital assets. 
Recently, Ledin has launched a Bitcoin mortgage product as well that lets you use Bitcoin to buy a home or finance one that you already own. So go to Ledin.io, that's L-E-D-N.io today to sign up. Ed Dowd, welcome back to the What Is Money show. Awesome to be here again. Thanks for having me on, Robert. So happy to have you again. Um, my friend Mike Hill originally turned me on to your work, um, and this was back when everything was still going on. You were very controversial at that time. And it is refreshing to see how, how much your work has been embraced by other popular people. It really seems like the truth is starting to get out in a big way. And um, I, I just couldn't, couldn't be happier about that. And by way of just quick reintroduction for you, uh, you've recently released a book titled Cause Unknown the epidemic of sudden death in 2021 and 2022, um, obviously covering the the COVID saga and, and what's been going on there. So, and one other thing I guess I'll mention here at the top of the show is your website. Um, you The book has a lot of facts and figures and data. Uh, the website, I think, points people to a lot of this excess mortality slash disability data related to this entire saga. Uh, we'll put this in the show notes as well, but I'll mention it here. It's financetechnologies.com, but it's spelled P-H instead of an F in finance. So P-H-I-N-A-N-C-E technologies.com. Um, with all that said, welcome back. <laughs> I would like to start with this concept you mentioned, I heard that you mentioned this on the Aubrey Marcus podcast of this entire COVID saga being a meta fraud. And I thought this was such an excellent framing um, in that some people demonize conspiracy theorists as people thinking that there are some guys in a room somewhere hatching an evil plot to do whatever the thing is, in this case, maybe poison people. But you make the point that that's not actually the case. It's something more like uh, opportunist, right? Just with dollar signs in their eyes and people seeing cash flows and revenue streams taking advantage of a broken incentive structure. And I just thought that framing was so, there's so much overlap with that framing and how I perceive the fiat currency complex um, that I just thought it was a really excellent take. So maybe we could start there. Just what do you mean by the concept of meta fraud? And how does it apply to this, this entire situation that's been unfolding? Well, let's start with the smaller frauds and let's just talk about quickly what the central banking system is. It's debt-based monetary system. That means for every dollar that's created, you create a corresponding debt. So to create money, you need to create credit. And the system that was created in 1913 needs constant credit creation um, and it needs it all the time. Um, there are periods of where there are credit uh, disinflations or uh, deflations where it pulls back, but then they reinflate with even more vigor at the bottom of every cycle. So, you know, in my career, you know, I came on to Wall Street in 1990 at HSBC, uh, and that was uh, we were, you know, we'd had uh, we were in the beginning of a recession. It was the SNL crisis, real estate. It was a smaller real estate crisis with SNL fraud. Uh, because the Fed, after the um, stock market crash in 87, uh, lowered interest rates and uh, credit was created and it uh, went into a mini SNL bubble that blew up and it wrapped up senators. Senator McCain was involved and all sorts of scandals erupted out of that. I also saw Kidder Peabody blow up in that low interest rate environment. That was an old Wall Street firm. I saw the Orange County fraud where that pension fund uh, was uh, starving for yield. Uh, to make their obligations. So they bought a bunch of um, product they didn't understand because the guy who was running it was a dope and Wall Street took advantage of that dope and sold them billions and billions of uh, what were uh, complex mortgage securities and agency securities that when interest rates went up, and as they always do, and you know, when inflation heats up, the Fed takes away the punch ball. Mm. He was left uh, without a job in Orange County, had a big hole to fill. And then um, the Fed did what they did after they raised interest rates. They started lowering them again uh, into the Y2K crisis. There was a big, uh, I don't know if you remember that, but uh, mm -hmm. there was this thought that 
every computer was going to shut down and the economy would screech to a halt. So for the three years leading into that, there was a lot of corporations that had to spend a ton of money. Also, dot coms uh, blossomed. And that easy money went into the dot com fraud, which led to corporate fraud, Enron, uh, WorldCom, Lucent, Nortel, a bunch of, bunch of these companies engaged in accounting fraud. And then uh, the Fed did what they did. They started after they raised rates, they lowered them again, and we created even more credit. That credit uh, went into the real estate bubble. Mm -hmm. uh, and, for, you know, for the next five years, uh, this country and other countries produced uh, homes that, you know, didn't need to be produced, gave uh, loans to people that couldn't never pay them back. And, uh, you know, that blew up famously in the great financial crisis. And interestingly enough, not one, not one banker went to jail in that whole saga. Not one banker mm -hmm. went to jail. And the Fed uh, uh, pumped money and started doing unprecedented things that they had never done before. That's when quantitative easing started to come into, into the uh, equation. Um, and all that all that bad debt uh, didn't disappear. The, the central banks of the globe bought all that those uh, bad loans. They rest on the balance sheets today still of the central banks. Mm. And, the, and the politicians spent unprecedented amounts of, uh, of, of money to stimulate uh, the debt economy. Uh, at the time. And so for the, the, the next 12 years, we saw a zombie economy where if you're close to the printing press, you did well. So who did well in the last 12 years? If you're in the C-suite of a corporation, you did well because stocks were pumped up from the easy money. The money didn't go out into the real economy, it went into financial assets. So if you're in a C-suite and you issued yourself options, you became fab fabulously wealthy. If you're a hedge fund manager, um, you did very well, primarily because after the great financial crisis, the current hedge fund managers uh, signed on to the regulatory uh, framework, which made it that much more expensive to start a hedge fund. So the big got bigger and they became risk averse and they just clipped big fat, you know, 2% fees, you know, buying large cap stocks. That's basically what hedge funds have been for the last, you know, 12 years. There's, yeah, I'm not going to disparage the whole industry, but mm -hmm. the big ones basically clipped coup coupons for the mm -hmm. most part. And then real estate people made a lot of money. So mm. people who actually do real things didn't make a lot of money. People who do the working of this country, people who, you know, uh, uh, sell their labor to their employer did not do well. Um, and you roll forward this money printing. We all knew in the financial community had to come to an end. And it, it rolled on to from banks to sovereign debt. So there was a sovereign debt bubble coming. And in 2019, um, you know, we started to see the beginnings of that. There was a repo crisis in the fall of 2019. Overnight lending rates exploded. The global economy was in a slowdown, a synchronized slowdown. And then mysteriously, COVID comes on the scene and allowed the central banks and the governments to spend even more unprecedented amounts of money. So when I say meta fraud, the frauds have been getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So the SNL fraud was tiny uh, compared to the, uh, the, the dot com fraud. The real estate fraud was way bigger than the dot-com fraud. And then the fraud that we just saw with COVID is the biggest fraud of all time. Mm. And and when I say meta fraud, uh, people saw an opportunity. So let's go through the three the three silos of industry that saw an opportunity. Obviously, the, ph the pharmaceutical industry saw dollar signs. They were going to get indemnified against any injuries, and the governments of the globe were going to buy their product. Mm. And uh, obviously, under the color of law, the, the product was forced uh, on many, many people. That, so that, that, that industry definitely uh, made a ton of money. Pfizer, in particular, you know, doubled their revenues from 40 billion to 90 plus billion in one year. Um, Moderna was a company that didn't have any products on the market prior to, to COVID-19. They've made billions. Um, then you had uh, the tech companies who saw dollar signs from surveillance. Uh, that this, that there, there was people got to remember there was a whole lot of chatter about surveillance and monitoring of the COVID vaccines, vaccine passports. Luckily, that seems to have gone by the wayside. But that was a big industry. They were they were they saw dollar signs. They also um, over the years have contracted with the CIA and the NSA, so they all have secret contracts with the CIA and NSA. So censorship was basically something that they willingly did for the government to mm -hmm. prevent uh, the truth from getting out as to what was really going on. Uh, then you had the media, another silo 
uh, that was getting paid by the pharmaceutical industry with their new newly rich ill-gotten gains uh, in form of advertising. So they had total incentive not to say anything bad against um, their products. And then you had the government giving a billion dollars to said same media companies to promote the products as well. So you don't need to be a, you don't need to be a genius to understand that the, 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 the we were creating what was called a COVID surveillance economy. Mm. So the, the, it was it was a new economic system basically, and people uh, ran at it wholeheartedly and just and you know through um, informed consent by the wayside. Uh, not to mention the whole medical industry as well. All the hospital companies were incentivized by um, the CARES Act that gave um, huge money for anybody uh, you know that uh, tested positive with COVID who died because of COVID in the hospital. So the incentive system was all out of whack, and you didn't need to be. You, d- you just don't need to envision, like I said, and you said, a bunch of um, fat uh, white men smoking cigars, drinking brandy. It just, it, the momentum was so big, it just a lot of people threw ethics and integrity out the window for big, big money. Mm. Yeah, and it's, it's terrible, right? The, the cost in terms of human life is the real it's easy for us to sit here and talk about how terrible this is financially, but the actual tangible cost is real human life, right? Loss of life, disability, Correct. et cetera. Um, and, and, I, and, know, and Robert, you know, yeah. that's a good point you just made. I want to reiterate that all these other frauds were financially based. Mm-hmm. Yes. You know, there were some people who were more adversely affected in some of these financial frauds and ended up committing suicide and what have you. But this is the first fraud that has harmed untold uns, uh, untold scores of people from a health and, and life perspective. Yes. Different than just money. Is This is the first fraud that, in my mind, has affected this many people physically and mentally and, and economically. It's, 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 it's unbelievable. Yeah, the ethical or moral violation um, that was present in all of these frauds, I guess for the first time in this particular one sort of permeated out into the biological domain, right? There was real loss of life, life, real disability um, for money, right? For financial gain. And I, I want to go back to how you started this, right? We talking about fiat currency itself, just the nature of it. Uh, as far as I can tell, it's an oxymoronic form of money, right? If we consider that money is something that extinguishes debt, and debt is a promise to deliver money in the future, the very notion of a debt-based money is almost a contradiction in terms, right? It's, it's, it's deceitful, intrinsically deceitful, something like that. And it leads to this financialization that you've described, right? Where the economy is, it's no longer distributing wealth to those that create value. It's distributing wealth to the administrators of the economy, away from the workers to the administrators. And so this is what I'm trying to capture when I talk about the corruption of money leading to the corruption of, you know, humanity, this is that pathway. And I think the meta fraud framing captures it nicely. My question here, and I, you know, you mentioned this offline, is it even possible to have a meta fraud absent fiat currency or central banking. Uh, You know, you mentioned like lockdowns, things like Operation Warp Speed. Would those things have even been possible without fiat currency? Uh, Let's let's go. Let's look at lockdowns. How do you lock down an economy and not have anybody work unless you can print unprecedented amounts of money and give it away for free and just hand it to people, which is what happened. Right. Um, and you, so you couldn't have locked down an, an economy. First of all, we've, we've come to learn that locking down during a pandemic is the worst thing you can do. But so they were able to lock it down. The, the mechanism was fiat currency given to people to take time off. Mm. So that's one. So you couldn't have done it in a, in a normal, non, you know, debt based fiat currency system. Uh, you couldn't have done that. Then, then the other thing, Operation Warp Speed, um, that probably wouldn't have happened because uh it was fraudulent the, the whole idea of operation warp speed was fraudulent to begin with because basically 
what people don't realize is we we suspended with clinical trials. Okay, they they they, they went through the motions of doing them, but they were in such a short time frame that it could not have possibly developed a safe and effective product. It, mm. it, it's physically impossible given what we know about um, how these things normally operate. So that that the fiat based system funded that whole thing. I mean that was. That, that was a and it, and it incentivized the regulatory system to overlook normal safety mm -hmm. because they were under the gun and they their paycheck comes from the government and the government prints money right basically so the fed prints money and gives it to the government right yeah so it's so twisted i, I get just to go back to and we're not going to get too deep into this on this episode you've done this on a lot of other of your other recent podcast appearances going into the data and the facts about excess mortality and whatnot again the website um that we mentioned at the top of the show is is where i'd point people for that but in general i would say that these magic juice experiments have just been extremely detrimental right that 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 fact is settled it's been harmful um, yeah, I think it, it, it's it, it's it's settled to the point where um, I've proven without a doubt that the employed of our country have had it's been detrimental to your health to be employed in 21 and 22. They've had worse health outcomes uh, in both excess mortality and disabilities via the general population. Mm -hmm. That relationship was never held before. Employed people by the very nature of getting up in the morning, leaving their home, and getting to work and putting in a full eight hours are healthier than the, the rest of the population. That includes retired, young, disabled, um, generally sick people who can't work. It's net, this relationship has never had, we've never seen this before until 21 and 22. So uh, my, my thesis is it's the magic juice. I'm waiting for another explanation, haven't had one yet. And as far as I'm concerned, I'm 120% convicted that it's been settled. And now my job has been to warn folks about that and also get politicians to, to look at it. And I did go before Senator Ron Johnson and say this. I said it was a national security issue. And he's one man, he's one senator. Mm -hmm. uh, but the psychological issues that are preventing people from seeing this fact are unbelievable. And it's mm -hmm. insane. Yeah, absolutely. I th Just to mention one stat, I, I tell me if I'm wrong here, but I think you said that the estimates were around 1.2 million Americans disabled or injured by the magic juice uh no the number so the number of uh, employed who were uh, disabled by the magic juice is 1.7 since february of 21 wow. 3.2 total were disabled in addition to what was the, the run rate beforehand so half of half of the people that have been disabled are employed so that that's a national security problem the dead are a lot higher um the estimates are anywhere from you know, 300,000 to a million dead. I mean, I, you know, we, we're coming up with, again, you know, this is an estimate. Uh, so for every um, uh, four uh, disabilities, we've calculated one death, mm. or from one death is four disabilities. So it's about, we, we come up with around 800,000 wow. dead because of the magic juice. Now, we don't go out with that number a lot because, you know, we can't prove it, but that's what the math is suggesting from the disabilities and the excess mortality. Yeah. And just easy to say the number, but man, to consider the gravity of that, that statement is um, difficult and, and painful. Right. Um, and this, Again, the fraud, like at the point you made earlier, the frauds seem to get bigger and bigger with the expansion of US M2 or whatever your metric of money supply is, right? Like yeah, the, M2 is good. M2 is good enough. Right. They're fueling, like, we're fueling larger fraud, f larger meta, meta frauds, I guess you would say. So there's this, it's almost like a self deception that's propagating across the world with, um, with this, the printing of money, but it's now, again, like you said earlier, it's transcended the purely financial domain, right? The savings and loan crisis in the eighties, right? That was just a lot of financial pain. Maybe a few people killed themselves. I'm not sure. 
But this is something very different, right? This is, we're talking about, we're flirting with the idea for uh, non-consensual magic juice doses for a while. Um, people obviously were coerced into getting these things, you know, to keep their job or to travel or whatever it may be. So um, it's almost beyond the scope of fraud at this point. It's it's um, something much more violent or harmful even. Well, so yeah, it's beyond fraud. And the data that's on our website, the data that I see, they see. And who are they? The regulators, the health authorities, the government, maybe not the politicians because they're clueless for the most part. Yeah. Um, but it's the, 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 the authorities, the regime, the establishment, whatever you want to call them, the global um, folks in charge of our health care see this. And so in the book, at the end of the book, I say at this point, regardless of the who and the why, it's a cover up and it's a crime mm. and it's malfeasance and it's negligence. So the longer this goes on without pulling uh, the magic juice, the more I'm convinced that this one, and again, we're going to have to have um, people above my pay grade investigate all this. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll find out what went, what, what went on. Was it was it really a colossal mistake or was there people who kind of knew this would happen but did it anyways? Yeah, it's a, a big question mark, but uh, it does seem definitive that this thing is not at all what it was represented to be, right? Safe and effective. It could hardly be further from the truth. Um, not safe, nor is it effective in any way. Um, okay. <laughs> to transition to a, an even heavier topic, if that's possible, um, I want to talk about how this might be related to war, world war, even like the specter of world war three. And I think you went on Bannon's war room and you were talking about the capital markets are kind of preparing for world war three. And, you know, that would be the ultimate wipeout of narrative or, or, or loss of control narrative. So what what do you mean by that? What do you mean by capital markets are preparing for World War III? And do you think the escalation is this a natural escalation, or is this is there an element of of manufactured narrative here as well? So when I say capital markets, I mean smart money. Not not most of Wall Street is clueless. Most of Wall Street doesn't even know what we know and what you and I are talking about. Mm -hmm. Okay. That message is still slowly getting out there. There are some people who are starting to figure it out. Some people are expressing um, bets in individual industries and stocks, what have you. But, uh, you know, I talked to a, a lot of smart people. And uh, as of last year, uh, there were people talking about World War III. But now I've, that number, there was a small number of people. Now that number is growing. And people are saying... Uh, the only way I see out of this, the way that, you know, th this what's coming is war to to, to create, to, to, to sustain inflation and, 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 and wipe um, what would be colossal global anger off the map. Because, you know, you want people to focus on the others mm -hmm. rather than the politicians and the central bankers. At the, at the end of the day. The blame for what's about to come financially is laid at the feet of the central bankers and the politicians. Mm -hmm. Anything else is a distraction. And also the fiat system itself kind of creates uh, problems on its own. So let's look at China. China uh, initially got a lot of their growth once they got into the WTO, the World Trade, Trade Organization, I think in the early 2000s. The initial capital investment was corporations in the United States relocating manufacturing over there. So they borrowed money to build, you know, manufacturing plants. So that debt was at least associated with productive assets um, and their population was growing. So they had a boom, they had a booming economy from 2000 to 2008. And uh, they, you know, if you remember, then there was a commodity cycle. China was buying every commodity under mm -hmm. the sun. Oil, oil was going up. China, China, China was the was the uh, the uh, the catchphrase during that time. Then the Great Financial Crisis came, and China hit hit a wall. And China 
uh, started to um, they'd already they're they're already borrowing in dollars, but then the the borrowing in dollars internally exploded. So they started borrowing in dollars, and they created tons of infrastructure projects and real uh, infrastructure projects to nowhere and real estate ghost cities. The good news initially was their population was still growing, so they were able to kind of, you know, muddle along from 2008 to 2020. But in 20, 2020, coincidentally, they hit a dem- demographic wall, mm. okay, meaning their population is now in decline. And demographics are destiny and have a lot to do with economic growth or decline of any country. So they had borrowed unprecedented amounts of money just to keep the thing going from 2008 to 2020. And then from 2020 on, they've had a, a series of real estate crises, debt crises. Their, their economy is in total free fall right now, total free fall. Hmm. And zero COVID policy wasn't because they gave a, they cared about COVID. It was cover for bank runs, uh, food riots, employment riots. I mean, there's riots all over China all the time. It finally got so bad that it made the news in the fall of last year, if you remember, I think around November, December of last year, we started hearing about the riots in China and zero COVID policy. Um, China is in a free fall economically. My 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 uh, partner, Carlos Allegri, has written a book called Economic Cycles, Debt and Demographics, and he predicted this. And he says right now, China, we have to worry about China on the geo, geopolitical Front because they borrowed a ton of dollars. The dollar is going up because there's a credit crisis. So China has to blame someone for what's going on in China, and it's not going to be them or the party leaders. Who are they going to blame, Robert? Anybody else? Probably mm-hmm. us. Mm-hmm. So war, war. The 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 debt based dollar reserve system, fiat system, creates war through cycles, mm. and and there's a war cycle coming because. No, no one can pay this money back. Internally, there's going to be strife, and and when there's internal strife, you have a choice. You you you, you know you, you bite the bullet and say, yeah, it was our fault, or you create a boogeyman. What do you think most people are going to opt to do? Create right. a boogeyman. Yeah, no, that's very in line with human nature, in my estimation. And that this that very notion reminds me of that other term you've used. ABV, right? Anything but the magic juice. Right. Um, is this something that, I don't know, what, is, is this just a product of human nature that we have to go through the, I'm, what else comes to mind here is the work of Rene Girard, who talks about mimetic crises, where like societies whip themselves into frenzies and eventually they have to point all of that animosity at a scapegoat of some kind to have relief. So are we just going into one of these types of events where uh, all of the all of the deception and lying and overborrowing and misallocating of capital has to culminate in some release? And I, I imagine war is just the ultimate form of that release. Yeah. So I've always speculated the sovereign debt crisis would occur with a currency crisis and somebody somewhere starts to go belly up and then it spreads. So. When that occurs and a country's people start to starve, you know, they have a choice, right? And right. Uh, the choice is uh, be overthrown or uh, create a boogeyman. And uh, that's unfortunately the way the system works. The system is a war cycle system, debt based fiat currencies. We couldn't have these wars without money that's created from nothing. That's right. We just couldn't because yeah. they're not productive assets. Yeah. War assets are not productive. You need them. But you don't need a constant expansion of war assets. And then if you look at the U.S. defense industry, I mean, it needs to constantly grow and it creates, I mean, we can, we can, we can go down a rabbit hole after rabbit hole, but a lot of the conflicts that we've been involved in uh, were created, in my humble opinion. I mean, yeah. WMD in Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, you know, there was a guy hiding in the cave, so we took over that country for 20 years. And surprisingly, the poppy production there went from 20% of the market to 80% while we were there. I mean, just example, why are we in Syria? Oh, because there's natural gas and, you know, oil. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. you know, why don't we ever go after Why don't we ever start war in a country without natural resources? Well, because it's not profitable. Right. Absolutely. 
Yeah, that's a whole, you're right, a rabbit hole in and unto itself. But suffice it to say that the existence of fiat currency allows a belligerent state to wage war, to fund war beyond the confines of its own balance sheet, right? It doesn't have just its own war chest of gold or whatever the resources may be. It can now hyperinflate the currency and tap into the savings of the entire population. So once again, it's no surprise that the expansion of warfare in the 20th century went hand in hand with the expansion of money supplies. I mean, these things are very uh, intimately connected, let's say. Um, okay, slight shift in gears here, but the, what is going on with this shift in LIBOR to SOFR? I actually just heard about this, which is, I guess, scheduled a transition that's scheduled for June 30th, 2023. Um, and a lot of this is coming kind of secondhand through Lynette Zhang, who talked about it. Do you have many thoughts on this uh, as to how this, does this play into any of the things we're talking about here? Is this um, something else that's being manufactured or, or engineered for a specific purpose? You know, I have not looked at that issue terribly closely. I do know that there were LIBOR scandals and there's a lot of fraud around that. And I guess this is just a response to that fraud that's been going on for years and years and years yeah. where they set, they set LIBOR. Uh, and it was kind of a cabal of bankers that would set it. Yeah. Um, I guess the idea is you won't be able to, you know, set, you know, um, conspire to set the rates. But, you know, we'll see. My my biggest problem right now is I see uh, the Fed hiking into a recession, which we've never done before. Mm. Uh, we're we're definitely going into a deep recession, Q1, Q2, and um, uh, right now the stock markets are kind of blowing this off. But we'll 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 see what happens and how this is resolved in the next several weeks. There's big inflection points coming that we're monitoring in the capital markets. The dollar had one of the longest seasonal cycles on record. It was an extended cycle. So we were expecting a pullback. We've had a pullback since the, uh, uh, right before the um, election. And we're monitoring this week, the dollar might be putting in what we call a week weekly swing low and putting in an intermediate term cycle and a seasonal cycle. And if it does, and, and we need more proof and evidence, but you know, if I was betting, man, the dollar's about to start to rally uh, the dollar versus other currencies, and it's probably going to go to a new high this year. And again, you've heard me talk about the dollar fails up, and then mm -hmm. a new system is introduced. So yeah. we're about we're capital markets are about to realign themselves again. We've had a little bit of a respite since uh, before the election, and I think we're going to see economic reality and financial markets uh, match up again. The Baltic Dry Index, which you know measures like shipping rates. Mm -hmm. uh, has fallen to an it, it, it's it's it just plummeted in the month of January and fallen to new lows. It's BDI on stock stock charts, and uh, if you look at what's been going on with um, stocks, the BDI has been leading the stock market by a couple months. So mm -hmm. it peaked uh, before stocks peaked, and it, it it goes down. Stocks will then follow a couple months later. So I suspect. Uh, the, the masses and everybody right now has kind of been lulled into sleep uh, if they're not aware of what's going on with the magic juice, that everything's okay. It's not okay. The real underlying economy is a disaster. Mm. Yeah. Certainly is. The dollar failing up, is that something you could expand on a little bit? Because I think people get really confused about, okay, you print too much money, the dollar is debased, it loses value over time. So I should just race to hold anything that's not dollars. But the, you know, that's intuitive, I guess, but it's somewhat counterintuitive that the dollar often gets stronger in these crisis events by virtue of it being a global reserve currency, right? And I always describe it like this, that if you consider that money is like an insurance policy against uncertainty, when uncertainty is rising, right? People are, they're stacking dollars, right? They want to hold the most liquid asset, which is to hold the, the instrument of greatest optionality because you don't, you're facing uncertainty, right? And that's the, the optimal strategy against uncertainty is optionality. So even though the dollar is being debased and declining, 
it kind of paradoxically can rally a lot. Um, how do you, but then of course there's a flip side to that you get the inflation, you get the deflation cycles, but they're typically followed by an inflationary cycle. So how do you personally navigate that? How do you explain that to people? Like how do you decrypt that whole, uh, kind of esoteric area of the dollar failing up? So if you go back to the dot-com crisis, the Fed lowered interest rates and a lot of that money went into, you know, real estate bubble in the U.S. But a lot of those dollars started going overseas and especially after the great financial crisis. So the, all the dollars created weren't being uh, the credit creation was overseas. So a lot of countries used the, the cheap money. So there wasn't a lot of if you remember, the banking system was dead and banks weren't lending in the U.S. Mm -hmm. So a lot of that money was lent overseas and they, a lot of countries and corporations overseas issued what's called dollar denominated debt. So there's something like 15 trillion notional dollar denominated debt overseas. So as the economies, their economies start to go down, it becomes harder and harder for them to pay back the debt. So there's a demand for dollars. So mm -hmm. paradoxically, um, and credit's not being created. So when credit's created, the dollar debases itself. When credit mm -hmm. is contracting, the dollar goes up because people are scrambling for dollars to either extinguish debt uh, or defaults or uh, it, uh, they have to pay the, the, the cost and it becomes onerous. And it's, it's kind of it's a reflexive cycle. It feeds mm -hmm. on itself. So ec economic activity going down causes the dollar to go up. Mm -hmm. Economic activity going up causes the dollar to go down because the primary, like uh, it's the world reserve currency. So when economies are doing well, credit's created. When yep. economies are contracting, credit is destroyed. And since we're debt-based world reserve currency, it, it paradoxically causes the dollar to go up in, in right. value versus other currencies. So, and also there is a safety component to it as well. Um, but I suspect the dollar will fail up and that, you know, uh, the world, uh, the world, and, you know, that's why there's this big um, movement for the BRICS to de-dollarize themselves because the dollar is a weapon. Mm. Uh, they view it as a weapon. They've borrowed in dollars. And if, once the Fed starts raising interest rates, it becomes onerous for them. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're at the, they're, we're, they're literally the Federal Reserve kind of controls the economies of the globe. It's the world interest rate it's not the u.s interest rate it's the world interest rate right so it's it, it, it's um it's infected and poisoned the whole globe so the whole globe is uh beholden to the federal reserve and are addicted to the crack cocaine so when they pull back pull the punch bowl dollars become scarce and they're by raising interest rates they're pulling the punch bowl yeah exactly so this i guess the heart of all of this is that we have centrally planned money right Correct. And price setting in terms of the interest rate. And that creates all like we know this in other markets, right? When you centrally plan other markets, you get all these perverse outcomes where you try to create a price ceiling to help buyers or whatever it may be, and you end up creating giant I can't remember because of its shortages, shortages in the case of a price ceiling. I I forget which way it goes. You either get surpluses or shortages, depending on the price ceiling or the price floor, but um the solution is always to just stop intervening right? and just let the market clear right. where it needs to clear. Um, and the market for money is no different. Uh, what do you like? Do you have, and this is not financial advice, but do you have thoughts on how to be properly positioned given all of this uncertainty um, and meta fraud that we're going through? So, you know, I, I don't like to give investment advice because there's a lot of people who like to time and trade and timing is always tough. But yeah, one of the things I've said since I came on the scene in February of 21 was having some portion of your portfolio in cash to take advantage of cheaper assets in the future is not a bad idea. And that's basically what I've said. And um, and people say, well, Ed, uh, you know, inflation's raging. Well, yeah. OK, uh, if you think stocks are going to go down or, you know, yields are going to go up and this and that. And uh, do you think a 50 percent haircut or a 10 percent inflation haircut is worse? Well, we all and, and most people, unfortunately, 
got decimated last year in technology stocks. Those got just absolutely, you know, the indices were down 20%, but there was a big rotation underneath. If you were a tech investor, you were taken out to the woodshed. So mm -hmm. depends on what stocks you own. Um, obviously, um, you know, having a uh, diversification of assets is helpful. So like don't have everything in stocks and bonds, have some go physical gold and silver, have some Bitcoin, mm -hmm. have something that isn't, you know, just traditional 60, 40. Mm -hmm. That's not, that's not a bad idea. And cash. Um, yeah. I've never told people what percentage of their portfolio should be cash. And I do know that uh, there's a panic coming at some point, whether it's this year or next year, don't know. But when it happens, you'll know it. The, that's when the Bloombergs of the world and the MSNBCs and the CNBCs tell you that the world's ending. That's when you buy. Mm -hmm. That's when right. you go back in, into stocks and bonds when everyone says the world's ending. And right. we haven't gotten, we're not even near that point yet. Do you think that's because of all the money we've printed over the past two years that has just sort of insulated us from that harsh economic reality that things are really screwed up? Well, so people have this belief system that central banks are omniscient and central banks have everything under control. Right now, we've had this rally in financial assets the, since October because the Fed started signaling that they were going to pause. Mm -hmm. What people seem to forget is in 2000, uh, um, in in uh, in 2000, the Fed paused and started cutting interest rates. The stock market still went down 50. percent I mean, they were cutting throughout 2000 and 2001. And we bought in in 02. Mm -hmm. uh, in the Great Financial Crisis, they started cutting in 07, and and then we went. You know, you know what happens in the next two years. So mm -hmm. people seem to think because the Fed's pausing, everything's going to be fine. The damage mm -hmm. has already been done. So right. by the Fed doing what they did. They've already screeched the economy to a halt, and it's going to stay that way for a while. The effects of monetary raising and lowering are not felt until 12 to 24 months after the, they start doing it. So mm -hmm. we're not even in the front. They started raising in February last year. So yeah. the, fa the fact that they're pausing has everybody thinking, oh, the Fed is our friend again. But they don't. no one studies history. Hmm. And, we, and my friend Tim Wood, who is a, a great cycles analyst, has looked at all the great um, uh, downturns in the stock market, and they usually require three things. It's called the checkmate chart. Commodities peak, stocks peak, and interest rates peak. Hmm. And not, not in that order. So this cycle, stocks peaked first in January, commodities peaked in June, and interest rates are about to peak hmm. soon. And when they do, that's when the real damage comes. So everyone's all like, oh, the Fed is going to pause. No, the, the Fed is not omniscient. The Fed doesn't control. The, 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 the thought that the Fed controls everything is an illusion. And they yeah. want you to think that. Right. Do you think, um, well, I guess, so historically, again, when those events happen, typically maximum pain does set in. And then eventually the Fed will pivot and start to print money again. Um, I guess it's kind of a two-part question. Do you think that is the pattern this will follow again? And then two, what do you think about the use of this catastrophe or some other narrative to introduce CBDCs? Do you think that's going to be part of the, the playbook this time around? So the, the path is uncertain going forward. The path... Um, you know, the Fed is going to have to do even more uh, as they pivot. They're going to be, be, be behind the eight ball as they always are. And it's going to take unprecedented amounts of weirdness from their on their part to say yeah. what's coming. So my, my, I, I, it's hard to predict what's going to happen. So that's why I think you have to look to global events and maximum pain as a, uh, as a precursor to a CBDC. So yeah. maybe if I'm a central banker and I know my system's about to blow up, maybe that's what I want. I want maximum pain. And then mm. something is introduced that's um, uh, going to save us all. But mm. you need to blame what's happening, not on the central banks or the politicians, but on the event or events. Mm. So what, what could those events be? World War III, another virus, um, 
cyber attacks, you name it. It just it just isn't central bankers or politicians. But you're going to need a boogeyman. The Federal Reserve in 2020 could not have done what they did without COVID. They printed 65 percent year over year money supply growth. The most the the, the largest increase ever. I mean, if you look at the the growth of the of the uh, yeah. Fed's balance sheet, it was like this, and yeah. then it went like this. Yeah. They couldn't have done that without COVID. Right. They could not have done that. So we would expect to see another boogeyman of some variety. Yeah. At that point. And then the introduction of the solution, right? Yeah. Um, right. The solution is coming. And look, I have a thesis. Uh, this is pure speculation on my part. Again, I, I but I find the WE. F, which mm. I really didn't know existed until COVID. It was like their coming out party. Mm-hmm. Okay, they were mm-hmm. introduced to Klaus Schwab and Harari and all these like freaks. Mm-hmm. And you know they were telling us, uh, "You will own nothing, eat bugs, and be happy." And now we get you know Harari talking about hooking us into the into the Borg, and we're going to eat bugs. And you know, Robert, quite frankly, these people are so such caricatures of Bond villains. I don't think. I, I truly believe they believe what they're saying, but I think if I was, you know, gonna cr- introduce a new monetary system, I'd let those clowns say what they're gonna say, offer them up as sacrificial lambs, and then have some, you know, smooth talking, beautiful, reasonable sounding people out of left field come and introduce the mm. new system. Mm. That's what I would do: create a dialectic, people mad and freaks saying we're gonna enslave you, and then, but the real system's between the two. And right. The real system will be occulted, meaning we won't really know how it works. The people who understand it will have all the power, and we have a new system and new shadowy folks again. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. The the whole thesis, antithesis, and then introduce the synthesis kind of thing, right? Yeah. I mean, do um, you really think uh, uh, Klaus Schwab and Harari sell in Peoria? They just don't. So most people are, right. are just think this is a, you know, that, well, a lot of people believe this is what they're trying to do. They say they're going to do it, but I just, there's no way that sells. It doesn't sell. Right. Right. But maybe it, it could be serving this larger purpose that you're describing. Just yeah, like it, it, being like, so it, it, outlandish. Yeah. That we introduce this, it sounds reasonable. And you're like, oh, that sounds okay. And we, oh, by the way, Klaus Schwab and yeah. all these, these people are being, are putting, are being put on trial somewhere. What, you know, and we feel great. Right. Mm-hmm. So by like virtue, it's the, the reasonableness of the proposition though, is somewhat dependent on the unreasonable, unreasonableness of the WEF Correct. eating the bugs and all that nonsense. Yeah. I think it makes sense, honestly. Um, so that's a good reminder to be afraid of any good looking, smooth talking people that suddenly appear <laughs> pushing yeah. whatever it is. Or they could be amongst us already. I mean, yeah. you know, I mean, I've talked about we all need, you know, people like you and me and the the common man need a seat at the table, which we won't get. Mm-hmm. But whoever purports to be at the seat of the table for us, we need to vet and mm-hmm. examine and watch what they do, uh, do, not what they say. Absolutely. Speaking of that, watching what they do, not what they say. I'm pretty sure central banks have started buying gold at a pretty significant clip again recently. Um, do you think gold's going to play a role in whatever is coming next? I know we're speculating again here, but what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, okay. So if the, if the dollar's going to fail up and you're a central banker and you know that dollar's going to get sold to you on the cheap because the dollar and gold tend to be inversely related. Mm-hmm. So you're, you're 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 creating a credit crisis. Dollar goes up. People are going to puke gold. You buy gold and accumulate gold at, at, at cheap prices. Then the new mm-hmm. system gets introduced. UBI. There'll be hyperinflation. You own gold. Mm-hmm. I mean that it, that just seems like a good in, a good play. Whether they're going to introduce it as part of the the new monetary system and backs anything, I don't know. I'm not in the room. But yeah. if I was a if I would if I if I knew the system was going to fail the dollar up, which I think they know. They, they can't be that dumb. Right. But the dollar fails up, gold uh, goes down. We're tracking, by the way, gold might start to go down again. Um, 
and you buy it on the cheap. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that makes sense to me. It does. It just seems like there's another, I mean, again, looking through the lens of Bitcoin really, but it seems like there's another opportunity to say that your currency is backed by gold again and then just not make good on the promise. Right. So it's like another um, extension of the fiat game. You'd be like, Oh, look, we really messed up. Fiat currency doesn't work. Actually. We thought gold was a barbaric relic or whatever Kane said about it, but actually we need to go back to gold and now all our currency is backed by gold. We have it all in Fort Knox, you know, we're good, something like that. But the reality would be, you know, either the gold's not there or it's not redeemable or they're not going to make good on the promise. Um, it just seems like another one of those strategic plays, kind of like you're describing with the, the WEF thesis, antithesis, synthesis, synthesis thing. So I'm, I was just curious about that. No, I look, I don't know what the, the, the I, I just think it looks like a good trade to me, mm -hmm. whether they're going to try to wrap it into um, a new monetary system. I don't know, but yeah. that, that, that I wouldn't put it past them. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, CrowdHealth. CrowdHealth is a Bitcoin-enabled alternative to legacy health insurance. Now let's face it, legacy health insurance is an absolute scam. Nobody can explain this better than the legendary comedian Chris Rock. Insurance. You got to have some insurance. You got to. That's an insurance. They shouldn't even call it insurance. They should just call it in case shit. <laughs> and I give a company some money in case shit happens. Now, if shit don't happen, shouldn't I get my money back? <laughs> <laughs> so with CrowdHealth, instead of just paying premiums that you'll never see again, you can hold part of this pool of savings in dollars and in Bitcoin through CrowdHealth. And when you have a health event, you can draw against this pool of communal savings. So go to joincrowdhealth.com slash breedlove to learn more or sign up. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Wasabi Wallet. Wasabi lets you use Bitcoin privately while still maintaining full control over your money. Specifically, Wasabi Wallet is an open source, non-custodial wallet with privacy built in by default. By using Wasabi, you're effectively putting the private back in private property. Wasabi Wallet is an easy to use privacy wallet that can support any amount of Bitcoin transactions. So go to wasabiwallet.io today to download the state-of-the-art wallet software. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Bitcoin Conference 2023. This three-day event will be held May 18th through 20th in Miami Beach. Uh, this is going to be the biggest event of the year, as it always is. And the past two years in Miami have simply been amazing. Uh, day one's industry day. Days two and three are going to be open to general admission. And I'd say this is a great place to go and network with Bitcoiners or even look for a job. Uh, just a really all around great experience. There's a fantastic speaker lineup, including Michael Saylor, Zoltan Pozar, Lynn Alden, Alex Gladstein, many others. And last year we did a 10 million sats giveaway for this event, and we're going to do it again this year. So to get discounted tickets and enter for a chance to win 10 million sats, go to b.tc slash conference slash 2023 and use code BREEDLOVE. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Element. Element is a delicious electrolyte drink mix with everything you need and nothing you don't. Element contains the ideal electrolyte ratio. It's got 1,000 milligrams of sodium, 200 milligrams of potassium, and 60 milligrams of magnesium. Element has no junk. It's got no sugar, no coloring, no artificial ingredients, no gluten, no fillers, no BS at all. Element is perfectly suited for people that are on a keto, low carb, or paleo diet. And as someone that eats a very heavy meat diet and does a lot of intermittent fasting, I simply love this stuff. So go to drinkelement.com slash breedlove. That's D-R-I-N-K-L-M-N-T dot com slash breedlove and make sure to get a free sample pack with your first purchase. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Casa. Casa makes it simple to buy and secure your Bitcoin without wondering whether you're doing it right. Specifically, Casa provides a multi-key custody solution, which is by far the most secure way to custody your Bitcoin. 
Now, when I talk about Bitcoin being theft-proof money or inviolable private property, a multi-key custody model is exactly what I am talking about. Using multiple keys lets you maintain full control of your Bitcoin while also giving you redundancy in case you lose one of the keys. It's also the best way to secure your Bitcoin for inheritance planning purposes. So go to keys.casa, that's C-A-S-A, today to sign up and use discount code BREEDLOVE. Should we talk about health insurance? Like what this means for the health insurance industry? Like, is it uh, even going to be possible to pay for all this? Like, I think so. I have, I can speculate as to what I think is going on in terms of what we just saw. So what I think is going on is we, we're going to have unprecedented uh, disabilities and excess mortality. I, I, I can't definitively say, because the good news is the, the booster uptake is, is abysmal. Right. My fear, my fear is, that there's medium and long-term effects. Um, and uh, the, there's already healthcare shortages, meaning like I've gotten radiologists talk to me anecdotally saying, you know, we have a shortage of radiologists. And that means you know, when you go in for a CAT scan or MRI, what used to take 24 hours to give you a reading takes two weeks. Hmm. And so you start to multiply these, and I and I had it happen with my car, wasn't able to get fixed on Maui, and and I'm hearing that this is happening. So there, we're starting to see a breakage of things, mm-hmm. and in, in healthcare, uh, if 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 you have a supply of healthcare professionals dwindling, and they you got to remember they were all mandated, like the first they they were the ones to get this. They were the first to take it and they got the most amount of boosters and that was required to keep your job. So if we have a healthcare staffing shortage, the prices of healthcare goes sky high. Uh, and then insurance companies keep raising premiums. So then it becomes, and then, you know, you're, a, and more and more companies are making you either, uh, they're either not giving the benefit. I mean, when I was at BlackRock way back when, uh, it was free and then they started making you pay some of it. Mm-hmm. And so just so it's going to be and I, I know people all over Maui just don't have health insurance. It's not it's it's too expensive for them. Mm-hmm. And so then the question becomes, you have to take your health into your, into your own hands and being healthy and fit and, and, and paying attention to diet has never been more important. And that's one of the things I've been focusing on individually with my own health. And, uh, you know, I think. There's going to be a rise of new, and I, I see it already from the COVID frontline doctors. There's going to be a new healthcare system that's going to, um, uh, it's going to be out of pocket, but it's going to be more holistic. Where like you know, you're not going in. You know, if you, if you have a broken arm, that's great. We, yeah. Doctors are good at that, but everything else, they treat symptoms. They don't treat the whole person. And we're going right. back from the allopathic, treat the symptoms to the treat you as a whole individual. So that you really don't end up getting cancers and all this shit that everybody mm. gets. And, you know, I don't know. Uh, yeah. Uh, how old are you, Robert? You're like 30, 37. Something? Yeah. You're 37. Mm. I'm fi- I'll be 56 in April. And, um, you know, when I was growing up, my grandparents, w- when they died, they just died. Mm-hmm. They didn't have a, a long decline. Uh, right. and they weren't on pills. There was right. in, 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 in the 70s and, and early 80s, this whole like you got your pill box mm-hmm. and you take your like 20 freaking that just didn't exist. Mm-hmm. So, you know, this this uh, whatever's gone on the last 40 years has been insidious. And I've never seen people more unhealthy, more unfit, more in a daze than than and than now. I yeah. mean, it's I mean. You, I mean, I live on Maui. I see these tourists come, and my God, I'm looking at these. I mean, these these are people in their 30s, and I'm like, yeah. you look awful, bro. Yeah, yeah, this yeah. Is just awful. Yeah, this what do they call it? The sad diet, the standard American diet, and yeah. it's it's not just the food; it's also the pills and the lifestyle, and you know, you sit in the, the cubicle, the antidepressants, or yeah. you know. If you, you're you're at a tech firm and everyone's taking Adderall so they can like right. perform better. I mean, it's all insanity. Yeah, it really is. Um, sitting under fluorescent lights, not moving. 
um, yeah, just very counter to our entire evolutionary history. So doesn't seem like that's going to work. Um, I mean, I'm a 56 year old guy and I can run up uh, this Wahe Ridge. I don't know if you ever did it on Maui, but like mm-hmm. I, I go up it super fast and I run down it and people look at me like I'm some like, you know, <laughs> like, 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 like comic book character because most people can't do it, but it's not that hard if you just live the way I live. It's just, I'm not that special. It's just that everyone's so unspecial. Right. <laughs> you know? Right. Right. The, the healthcare system is going to blow up is my, is, is the bottom line. It's going to, yeah. it's going to fall apart. And all that, all the costs of that though, obviously get passed out to consumers in the form of higher premiums or Correct. no coverage. Right. No, yeah. Yeah. Wow. And, um, and, and you know, they, they, that the, the Obamacare was a way to take over the health. We have, we, we have single payer systems. We don't call it that, but we are in a single payer system now. Mm-hmm. Obamacare did that. And the reason they did that is because the baby boomers were aging and they were going to bankrupt the healthcare system anyway. So, mm-hmm. you know, this is the demographics again are destiny. We had this, you know, the baby boomers really shaped the whole country. I mean, they mm-hmm. were a big, um, uh, you know, the demographic bulge. The they were the rabbit going through the python. Right, right, and they right. They affected right. all sorts of things. Interestingly enough, my my uh, partner Carlos, um, there he 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 figured out what your peak earning years were. He goes, he guess when that peaked for the boomers in two thousand and eight. Right when the and the housing hmm. crisis, right right in two thousand eight, that's when we've started. That we've been on a demographic peak spending decline ever since two thousand eight because of the baby boomers. Wow, yeah, that's interesting. So, I mean, that would lend a little credence to it being more engineered, right? That I guess it could just be coincidence that their peak earning well, no, years. The, the the planners, the, the the people, cycles and demographics have been kind of occulted from us. Mm-hmm. The, the the people who run the show know that no cycles and demographics and demographics mm-hmm. are destiny and they know that has a huge destiny for debt mm-hmm. and if you look at the euro carlos in the book talks about the euro it's not a question of if but when the euro blows up because half of europe uh, doesn't produce anything and has old people mm-hmm. and they're going to default and and germany's getting really tired of carrying everybody <laughs> right you know yeah yeah, that seems like a really bad deal for Germany. Uh, other than, I guess, with a weaker currency, they get more net exports. That might be a slight offset to that. There is, but there's gonna there's gonna be a, a come to Jesus moment uh, because the Southern European countries have a demographic. They're screwed demographically. It, right. Because, you know, you're basically they're not they're not paying into the system, and they're net users of pension system and dying and medical stuff because they're old. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Um, okay, maybe we can veer into some of the more esoteric stuff here. Sure, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll just say this is these, this is philosophical uh, insights that we have. Yeah, yeah. Um, one uh, a guy that helped me prepare for this episode. He sent me this um, this piece on Pfizer. He actually said. If you spell Pfizer backwards, it's Resfip, which translates in Hebrew to Reshef, which means the burner or the ravager. And it's an ancient West Semitic god of the plague and the underworld, the companion of Anath and the equivalent of the Babylonian god Nergal. Now, this may sound very far out to people, but um, there is this pattern of inversion with certain uh, occult groups as you might describe them and so you know what what's what is going on in this are there are there occult groups that inhabit these power structures and are I mean, I know we said earlier like it's a meta fraud it's not the traditional stereotypical fraud but now I'm sort of questioning the opposite like do you think there are these occult groups pushing certain agendas onto the world let's say and um the argument by you know many people that have written in this area that they try to hide these things in plain sight right they all all typically say what they're going to do they're very blatantly open about it um 
And now what's coming to mind, I don't know if you saw this going on on social media recently, but at the Grammys, they had that transgender performer doing a, a song called Unholy. Yeah. And yeah. it was just and a guy. Was Pfizer. Yeah. Dressed up as Satan. All there. Everyone's dressed up as devils. They're all dancing around, flame shooting everywhere. It's all this trans, you know, performance. And then right at the end of the performance, sponsored by Pfizer. Like, I mean, it, it's almost like out of a movie. Uh, so I don't know. Like, what do you think about all this? Like, I don't even know how to take it, honestly. It's it seems too obvious and too. Well, what what, what let's go. What, what, the word occult uh, has been bastardized. You know, a lot of people think you know associated with devil worship. Mm-hmm. All occult really means is hidden knowledge. Yeah. And what what is Wall Street? Wall Street is the business of asymmetric information. You have information. Yeah. That the other party doesn't have, and you make money off of that, right? With an informational disparity. Yes, we could start with talking about that, go into the occult, and go from there. I mean, it, I mean, it's basically you know something somebody doesn't know, and you take advantage of them economically, and or from a, or or control them, or you know, in, you know, use them to to coalesce your power. I mean, right. This, this the, the, you know the, the, there was a meme going around uh that i loved it's um it, i think it's as old as the babylonian uh mystery schools which is basically it's a king on a parapet looking down at the pitchforks and torch people and his advisor says to him you don't have to fight them you know you just have to convince the pitchfork people that the torch people want their pitchforks <laughs> yeah, that's it right right i, I mean what, what what do we know that's going on? There's been sub segments of groups, and the woke the wokeism is a way to con- continuously divide people. Yes, you know, into little small small victim groups. Right. You know, I think the people that run the show are just in, in the intelligence agencies have been using deep psychological knowledge to, uh, you know, control po- vast populations for years. That's interesting. So it's something something like scientific knowledge that is occulted from us used to yeah. socially Influence. engineer. That's what propaganda is. That's and the central bank digital currency is the ultimate control because you don't even need to propagandize someone. We don't want people to eat meat. Well, if you have a central bank digital currency, you go to the cash register, you try to ring it up. The, the woman at the cash register says, Oh, I, won't let me transact because the yeah. system knows that you've had your meat quota for the month. Right, so right. They don't, that, that's why they love the central bank digital currency because you don't even have to like do all the uh, propaganda and the and, and the magic, uh, you know, spell casting to get right. people to do what you want. Right. Yeah, you you're it's direct social engineering, right? You don't want yeah. people to do it. You just turn off the money for that option, whatever it may be. Yeah, yeah. And there, was a, um, there was a guy from the BIS. There's a video of him out there. He actually said that like one and a half years ago that like this will be give us complete social control. He right. admitted, it. right? It's somewhat. I mean, uh, it, it's intuitive if you really stop to think about the nature of money, like how much money is directing human action in the world. Like you wouldn't want people will do things for money. Like people spend their most of their life in pursuit of money. Right? That's what your nine to five job is, et cetera, et cetera. Um, even people that will tell you, Oh, I don't care about money. It's like, well, you have a full-time job, don't you? Like uh, your actions speak louder than your words. It's intuitive that if you put all that power in one institution or one grip or one, um, locus of control that that, I mean, that would be the ultimate tool of manipulation, psychological manipulation, social, sociological, and otherwise, um, yeah, I don't, it's, that's, that's hard, difficult to fight against that, I suppose. I want to ask you about statistics and their legitimacy, because we talk a lot about, obviously you've published a book with a lot of numbers in it, um, as we were going through this COVID saga, a lot of people were saying that, you know, trust the science, 
if you question the science, then you're somehow like an, like an in-group, out-group dynamic. How can we, I mean, these numbers and science and mathematics, these things are very important for getting a grip on the world, but uh, it's very, because it's so useful for getting a grip on the world that people can develop maybe a false sense of reliance on them. Like once you wrap something in mathematics, it just makes it look more truthful. Uh, we see this a lot in Keynesian economics where they have very sophisticated mathematical models, but the premise of Keynesian economics is total bullshit. Like it, it's acting as if the, the economy is some type of machine that you can press buttons and turn dials and pull levers and make outcomes when Obviously, the economy is something much more like the weather, right? You can't control it. It's a complex system. It's fluid. It's dynamic. Um, do you think that, and we, like, for instance, CPI is a big, obvious one, a very manipulated metric, does not reflect inflation. The, the calculation itself has changed over time uh, to suit certain policy goals. Can we? Are the numbers being issued by like the Bureau of Labor Statistics, these other health organizations, are they reliable? Like how, how do we navigate that? Like that we need, there's a great importance for clear, precise metrics, but there also seems to be a great incentive to, to kind of, to kind of manipulate those metrics to favor certain narratives. How can we as individual critical thinkers navigate that? So, you know, that's what we're, with the humanity project, our mission statement is basically to, we've come to the conclusion that uh, due to um, ca regulatory capture uh, and financial incentives, the global governments of the world aren't, not, not only are they, are they uh, hiding data from us, they're not presenting data mm -hmm. that uh, goes against narratives. So we're trying to take a stab at um, uh, putting out data the best we can with integrity and openness. Like, you know, my website, the Humanity Project with my partners, the data is there and we mm -hmm. have methodology papers, how we calculate excess mortality. We're trying to be open. Uh, and so, so one of the things we need to demand from governments is that the data is available to all the raw data sets. And that's not occurring. Um, can we trust the CDC? Well, we've been counting just ones and that's why we focus on the metadata ones and zeros dead not dead disabled not disabled and that and we don't get in and we've stayed away and shied away from do they have covid not have covid do they have, what are the diagnoses of the death we don't care because at the end of the day if they start hiding like deaths then mm -hmm. you know the, the, that the, their whole institution crumbles so what they're playing games with is, re, you know, we call them, recla it's called reclassification fraud. Mm -hmm. And I suspect, can't prove, nor do I care to prove because I don't have time. We suspect that there's a lot of sudden uh, death codes in the CDC that get changed over time. Uh, I've seen some evidence that that's occurring. So they, they can play games with classification, but they really can't hide the ones and zeros. So mm -hmm. it starts with the ones and zeros. So we're doing the binary metadata analysis. And that's what most of my conclusions are based on. It's just raw ones and zeros mm. uh we do need uh i believe unfortunately robert that we're going towards an alternative well i'm actually happy about this we're going towards an alternative system we're just going to create like the humanity project is like okay uh these people uh, have no integrity they're lying we're going to take our best shot at you know providing the data so people can make decisions based on the closest we think to real information so we're creating pro bono at the moment, alternative systems. We're an alternative regulatory collector of excess deaths and disabilities. Mm -hmm. You don't have to believe us, but you know, we don't have, we don't have um, any incentive to lie. And in mm -hmm. fact, when I started working with Carlos and uh, Yuri, that my two partners, they said, Ed, we believe you're correct on the magic juice. But um, if it turns out that the data is, suggestive that you're wrong will you admit you're wrong i'm like sure i don't have any like being wrong is mm -hmm. part of the game mm -hmm. and and I, I don't attach my ego to being I, you know look I, I i would hope that i could be proven wrong but at this point it's it's a moot point as far as i'm concerned mm -hmm. so we're going to create alternative uh systems you're in the process i mean you're a bitcoin 
uh, um, aficionado. Mm -hmm. You're all about alternatives. So this is where we're going. We we have to we have to unplug from the current corrupt system and create mm -hmm. new new systems. And that's what's going on. And eventually, if it gets really bad, we'll, we'll, we might have to do bartering for a time a time mm -hmm. being. Um, you know, on Maui, there's a lot of work trade here. Like someone will give you a massage, and you might fix their porch or, you know, mm -hmm. the, 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 mm -hmm. that happens all the time. That just happens. And I'm sure, you know, you've seen that on Kauai, a lot of work. Mm -hmm. We yeah. might be doing more of that as time goes on. Yeah. Well, hopefully, um, par well, I call those parallel systems typically, but yeah, it's yeah. the same type of thing, right? It's outside of the centrally controlled system. Uh, and hopefully something like Bitcoin gives us the option to not have to do that barter the barter is super inefficient. Like it's a great way to just easily step out, but obviously very inefficient from an econo yeah, correct. Econo economy I'd wide. See, I'd rather see crypto do something like that. And yeah. um, one of the, my, my, my two PhD physicists were working on crypto before I met them. And they're looking at, you know, they're not into the speculative part of it. They're looking at it. How do we navigate between an open ledger and a closed ledger. The open ledger can be viewed by the governments of the world. A closed ledger also leads to crime and, you know, other mm -hmm. things. So, like, we got to figure this out. Bitcoin will be part of it. Others might. But we're in the process of the parallel system, whether people know it or not. And yeah. if they don't start thinking about setting up their own parallel system, yeah. uh, they're not going to like what it's going to look like in, you know, three to five years. Yeah, and you, you have to it's a matter of survival, right? To at least have the option to, f to go into a parallel system. Like it doesn't, even if you don't believe anything we have to say, it's like, if there's a 0.1% chance, then you need to have access to something like that. Otherwise you're just putting all your proverbial eggs in one basket and you're very vulnerable, right? You, if we are right, you just won't, you won't survive basically, right? You'll get swept right. into the centrally planned system of healthcare and money and all these things. And you're, you're screwed basically. Smart, smart cities. You won't be able to drive yet. You're going to do everything within 15 minutes walking. I mean, that's the plan right. is the paralysis in the smart cities where we don't go more than 15 minutes from where we live and yeah. won't be allowed to. And yeah. you know, this is, yeah. this is pure insanity. Yeah. These are all tax the farms. Saving yeah, all in the name of saving uh, Gaia or planet Earth. Right, the it's ultimate a... boogeyman, the unlimited yeah. boogeyman. <laughs> right. Um, how has this journey been for you? Because I know you came, I mean, I assume at least in the public eye, you did not, you were not in the public eye before this. So you've gone from like obscurity to at least a, form of celebrity in these circles uh what do they call this like the us people in this corner of the internet the they used to call it the intellectual dark web things like that uh you just mentioned your your episode with aubrey marcus did over a million views um again very like encouraging to see truth getting out especially after what we went through the past two years of being uh, people that were speaking out against this, yourself, myself, others included, were vehemently demonized, right? As conspiracy theorists and everything else. So it's nice to see that sort of shift in momentum. How has this been on you individually, though? Like from a, an emotional standpoint, um, like ha, ha, how have you changed, I guess, as a result of this journey the past couple of years? Yeah, so... Uh, I was a guy who knew a financial collapse was coming. I didn't, I thought it would be war. Mm. Never in my wildest imagination did I think, and I've speculated upon this before, that they would use a global pandemic to introduce a, um, the plan was to have quarterly jabs for the rest of your life. And I said, there's no way after my, uh, my own health journey, you know, I, I struggled with depression in 2011 and 12, and I cured myself getting out of the system through uh, spiritual, uh, mental, and physical techniques that are, you know, ancient. Mm -hmm. And uh, I I cured myself of depression and anxiety, and I was going to be damned if I was going to, like, take an experimental vaccine or magic juice that uh, would uh, against my will. So I just said, I'm done. I'm done with the system. 
I'm, it's, it's now, it's got, the system has been hidden from us. This, this kind of this, this kind of evil incentive system, but then it manifested into jabs. Mm -hmm. And that's when I said, Nope, I'm done. Mm -hmm. And I began my journey just protesting. And I, through the, and I, I call it an act of God because I prayed to be of service. I just started to use my skill set to expose what's been going on. And throughout this journey, what's been interesting is meeting like-minded people. I felt very alone prior to this, but now mm. what's gone on is, well, not only have I met like-minded people, the, the awakening of many people has been phenomenal. So yeah. I'm now part of a community. And it's I have a local community of people. I have people like you and others that I've met, and it's um and it's morphed. Uh, you know, I did not know when I started this journey. I would hook up with two PhD physicists, uh, start a firm, and declare ourselves the watchdog of the watchdogs. It just hmm. we just keep going. Like we're the, the ideas and the conversations we're all having are phenomenal. Uh, so out of this great evil, great good is coming. We're all hmm. finding each other. So this journey continues and I keep, and it's, it's tough, Robert, you know, that you have to, you have to use a lot of discernment because a lot of people come at you to use you for their own purposes mm -hmm. and they have their own agendas. So you have to have a lot of discernment. And my, my, my major goal is stop the magic juice program, save lives. And from there we go from there. And if, if anything that I align myself with is along those lines, the book that I wrote, I didn't go seek to go write a book. It was pitched to me. And the idea was, a coffee table book with data and an illustration of what's gone on to change a mind. Mm. So as long as I have the intentions of doing good in the world, I'm aligned with it. So I'm, you know, I had a, I had a very um, group of it, a uh, very uh, well-heeled group of individuals fly to Maui to meet me. We don't know if there's anything going to come of it other than conversations, but this is what's going on. I, I feel like the journey for me has put me at the, the nexus of a movement and that movement is parallel systems. Mm -hmm. and systems that have integrity truth um and i you know i, I you know I, I followed you and you're all about the integrity and truth of sound money mm -hmm. and, you know from from these types of uh um conversations we're gonna all of us not just me or you but many people are going to create parallel systems that are gonna uh there's gonna be a lot of darkness and chaos over the next five years but we're building something underneath that darkness and chaos, I believe. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I do too. I feel this is a, a great cloud of uncertainty surrounds us, but there's some light that's becoming brighter, you know, beyond it. And I, I don't know exactly what it is, but um, definitely the connections, the community, the thinking, the honesty, the, um, I guess this, kind of restless pursuit of the truth, right? People are just asking questions. Like the thing that was pushed back against during the COVID saga, like don't question the science, which is again, a contradiction in terms when you understand that science is the methodological systematic asking of questions. Right. Like it doesn't right. make any fucking sense to say, don't ask, <laughs> don't question the science. Um, the people that push through that, you know, it's like, to see uh, the actual fruits of that that labor, I guess, materialize has been very encouraging to me. Um, and you mentioned good, good and evil, you know, and that is the other, for me, has been really um, made clear over the past three years that there is a fundamental tension between good and evil in the world. And I don't think it's good guys versus bad guys. I think it's each of us individually wrestling with good and evil in our hearts, as Soldier Nitsen said, you know, a long time ago. And in any moment, we can choose, right, to act in a way that aligns with the good or a way that that misaligns with the good. And for me, that's been uh, very spiritually evocative, I guess, right? Like you start to get your your spirit into your work. So I wonder. I use the word God, you know, it's deepened my relationship with God. I feel much more fulfilled in that relationship uh, after going through what we've been going through the past couple of years. And I'd like to ask you that question. I don't know if you use the term God or not. I know you're a spiritual guy. How has 
how has this experience changed your relationship with God or whatever word you like to use for that highest value? Yeah. So God has been a big part of my journey. Um, and, you know, quite honestly, the work begins, like you said, with yourself and you have to look at yourself first um, before mm. you can go around blaming other people for the woes. And I went through a depression uh, and the depression was basically a pity party. I was feeling <laughs> sorry for myself, a whole host of things. What was me? Blah, blah, blah. Doesn't, I don't need to get into specifics, but I've come to believe depression is uh, a, a, a massive pity party that you keep ruminating in your head and then your body shuts down. Mm. And I had to let go of all that victimhood and pity party and give it over to God. In uh, 2013, I moved to Maui in 2014. And that's when my journey really began of like self-healing and awareness and consciousness. And that's when I really started to see the world as it was. Mm. And um, I continue to battle. My biggest enemy is not uh, a boogeyman. My biggest enemy is me. So I have to always question my motives. Why am I doing something? What, mm. What's my intention? Right. And that has helped me. And I, in this journey, uh, I have some spiritual advisors that I bounce things off of. And basically... I need to, uh, God, is, so God has a, I had a plan. God has a better plan. So I let God kind of direct me and he directs me through me just sitting with things, not reacting. Whenever something happens to me where I get angry or, uh, or, or fearful, it's, it's a character flaw in me. So I need to mm. work through that pause. And then I usually end up making good decisions and discernment. So, you know, mm. aligning with people in this journey has been very important to align myself with good people. There's been some characters coming along the way um, that if I had, uh, you know, if I was egoic based and not as humble as I've tried to become, I would have let that, you know, they, they t you know, tempting me with egoic things. Yes. I could have gone off on that path. Mm -hmm. So you got to kind of ask yourself, why are you doing what you're doing? Um, and, you know, when the book was pitched to me, it wasn't about, you know, glorifying me. It was about making people aware of the problem and selling it. And, and and presenting it to people. It wasn't about me being a genius. And and mm -hmm. I kept out the who and the why on purpose because that's egoic based. And I had to let that go because we just want to show it is. I have theories. I'm a smart guy. You're a smart mm -hmm. guy. We have theories, but let's just present the problem as it is. And so this journey, it began with me and uh, it continues with me. And I know it continues with you as well. Mm -hmm. God guides me and the only person that can really derail me is me. There'll be people that come at me. I mean, mm -hmm. I put things on Twitter and then people come in and call me. I don't even respond. It's about energy. What energy do you want to give? Right. You know, what, do you want to give energy to your enemies or do you want to give energy to, to good people and helping people? That's where I focus. My enemies that want to like come at me, I just don't even, you know, I don't, I don't deal with them because there's just no point in ele elevating them. Yeah. Yeah, no. that's egoic. That's egoic base. That's me trying to prove I'm right. I, you know, I, I put the data out there. I'm going to, you know, start a hedge fund. We're going to put the bet on and that's it. And that, you know, you do you, I'm trying to help you, but if you don't want to listen to it, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's beautifully said. And it is a constant struggle, especially if you're on Twitter, because man, those temptations <laughs> to argue are ever present. Um, well, Ed, man, I really enjoy this conversation. I, you know, thank you for what you've done, what you are doing. Thank you for having the courage to stand up and talk about this, especially when people were being just harangued, you know, for, for even talking about the possibility of, of the magic juice being a scam or, or something like that. Um, your work's been incredible and I'm sure it's having a, a, very significant impact in the lives of people everywhere. Um, so thank you for that. No, thank you, Robert. And look, I just wanted, you know, to save a, a marginal life, a mar change a marginal mind. And, you know, that's what I'm trying to do. And, you know, it's funny when people ask me, were you fearful when you decided to go on this journey? I said, no, I had no choice. I mean, I literally, the day I decided to, you know, to go forward and people started coming at me, you know, because my friends thought I was crazy. Mm -hmm. I I said, worst case scenario, I, I worst case scenario in it. I go, okay, if they win and we get quarterly jabs, I'm going to go live in the jungles of Hana <laughs> and I'm going to be a crazy, 
man roaming around in my you know loin cloth. I said I'm <laughs> cool with that. That's, that's where I, that's where my head went. Uh, that's the advantage of being in Hawaii. It's like even if it goes worst case scenario, it's like well you're still in Hawaii, so. <laughs> right. awesome well ed thank you so much um could you uh maybe we just mention it one more time where people can find you on the internet yeah so i'm on twitter i got reinstated elon put me back on thank you elon at dowd edward d-o-w-d edward and getter at edward dowd i post simultaneously i also have uh my firm website, Finance Technologies, spelled PF instead of uh, an F. Go to the Humanities Project. That's where all the data is. We're trying to raise a fund. Uh, we're being very careful about who we talk to, so we're in no rush to raise the capital. Mm -hmm. And then secondly, uh, you can find me. I have a personal website. They lied. People died .com. Mm -hmm. So those are the four places you can find me. Awesome. Ed, thank you so much.